Uh, dear Denny, it's a great pleasure for us that you uh, came to Vienna and have time to uh, prepare this CD with works of uh, Walter Arlen. Uh, is it the first time that you are working with a living composer? Your, uh, and how is the special feeling of working with a composer of such an age? Um, it's not the first time. Um, but uh, obviously as pianists we spend a lot of time working with music written by people who are no longer are around. So it's always, it's always very interesting and very pleasurable to actually have a dialogue in the present with the person who has is, who is composed the music that you're working on because musical notation is not perfect. It's not, a, it's not a precise set of instructions. There's a lot beyond that that um, we're always searching for. And uh, of course when a composer is present it can be a huge help and insight into that into that sort of searching process so uh, it's been it's been very informative it's been um, it's also important when it's an idiom that we're not so familiar with because obviously we don't have in the case of uh, Walter Arlen's songs a, a performance tradition um, a an idea a popular idea of what these songs should be like or what they sound like there's been no debate about them no critical reports about them so in this case it's maybe even more important even more useful that we um, learn from him what what he's really after. Um, so uh, it's been it's been a great pleasure. It's been very interesting two weeks. And uh, what about the stories he is telling you? Uh, do you um, if, is it for you in a kind of insight in the compositions, or is it just stories behind uh, the music? No, it's never stories behind the music. I I always have believed that to understand a composer's music you have to understand the composer as a person um, as much as possible. Sometimes that's not terribly possible. And again, in this situation when we have uh, Walter here, we've, we've got the luxury of being able to get to know this person one-to-one -one, rather than you know, resorting to biographies and contemporary accounts and letters which of course have their own difficulties and problems because people suppress certain things. So it's, it's, again, it's, it's, um, that, that's been great. And I think, I think the more one learns uh, about that, the more... You know, one can't always say precisely how it leads to... It doesn't lead to a specific way of interpreting necessarily, but occasionally somehow being, being sort of cooked in that um, world of ideas can be very illuminating. and it, It's hard to touch exactly why, but on the other hand, if, if you don't engage with it, then I, I'm sure that you miss something. So, so, no, I don't think they are just stories. And, of course, they're very, they're, in this particular case, they're very moving stories. Um, and for me as well, because I am... I mean, I'm Jewish and my, my mother is Israeli, so I'm connected with that culturally um, quite strongly. So I, I suppose that also, for me, sort of somehow resonates in a, in a particular way. Uh, so... Yeah, it's been it's been very. Uh, uh, you uh, you told me that uh, there's no tradition of uh, Arlen perception like that. Uh, how do you how would you characterize the music of Arlen? Uh, the songs are very philosophical. The, the texts he, he has chosen are are very profound texts. They're um, really dealing with life and death and morality. There's the, they're very um, in a way. Very serious texts and um, you know existential text there, and I suppose um, musically he he has a very particular harmonic language his uh, it 's somewhat impressionistic but also um, he's, he has a very um, particular uh, use of dissonance um, to sort of highlight the poignancy of certain words in the poem so um, and uh, a lot of the music is reflective. There's a nostalgia always there. And you can feel even underneath um, the songs that are more calm that there's uh, sort of some inner, sort of inner angst there, inner tension, inner energy um, that is somehow um, sort of being subdued as well. Um, but these are just sort of early thoughts because, you know, obviously this music is in a way very new to me as well. So I'm sure that... Uh, my view will will change, and uh, you know, hopefully these songs will be performed more, and uh, they will take on a life of their own, uh, you know, beyond um, you know these sessions and beyond the dialogue with the composer himself. Yes, we have a great variety of composers who we are playing. 
um, are the uh, composers which were exiled or, or, or killed by the Nazis, so have they a special, um, are they a special part of your um, uh, sorry, pianistic uh, love band? Sorry. Yeah, uh, um, well, yes. Um, in general, I've, I've been devoting a fair bit of time, um, not necessarily to composers of that period, but composers who have been forgotten about um, for many different reasons, um, whether it's because their music was banned or whether it was because stylistically, for example, their music fell between the cracks you know, of uh, big changes in style. For example, um, romantic composers who continued to write romantic music after you know, Schoenberg's uh, Second Union School came along or whether it's um, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach on the cusp of Baroque and classical and what happens there. So I'm quite interested in music that is being written around times of great stylistic upheaval, if you like, and, and vigorous debate about what music should be and how it should be and why it should be. Um, because I think in those periods you find sort of very interesting things that not always necessarily the most famous and successful things, but ultimately works that, that were important in the development of, of something sort of new and, uh, and that then went on to become very popular, perhaps. So um, it's not necessarily limited to Entartete uh, uh, Musik or, or that kind of thing, but um, yes, in general, this is, this is part, of my, part of my life and I enjoy it uh, very much. You're pointing at a very uh, great topic in the 20th century. Because uh, when we look at the music of White Island at the same time in Congo and others, at the one hand side, uh, they were entartet, they were called entartet music by the Nazis, and after the war, they were called eclectic mm -hmm. composers by German musicologists and so on. Yeah? So they fell between Many, many, more than one crack. Yes, crack. yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, How do you deal with this uh, problem? I think, I mean, in the case of the 20th century, I really do think that we're now re-evaluating everything because probably in the 20th century, so much upheaval stylistically and culturally and nationally that in a way, and, and technologically, actually, so that in a way there have been so many changes and so many developments and so many different styles it, it's almost been an explosion really and, and I think when there is such an explosion for, for all these different reasons it just takes a lot of time for the dust to settle and for really to be able to evaluate um, all the music that was written in the 20th century without you know without just saying okay the, the uh, 12 ton music is it and the rest we're not interested it, it takes, takes a while for that to, to fade away and for, for us to be able to gain a perspective um, so, I mean, how do I deal with it? I don't know. I guess I deal with it by playing the music and looking at it and, and trying to serve it as best as I can so that people have a chance to hear it for, obviously, it's, it's my view, but sort of for what it is, for what I think it should be, and, and at least have the opportunity to evaluate it. I mean, if we don't play these composers, you know, uh, Korngold, you know, York Byrne, whoever it is, if we don't play them, if we don't get them out there, then, you know, no one will talk about them, no one will be able to engage with them, so I, I think that's, that's the best way of dealing with it now, is to, is to play it, and uh, grapple with it, and engage with it. And um, as you know, uh, we have uh, created a new society, Exit Artists, three years ago. Mm. Uh, what do you think we should do in the next years? Uh, what, would wow. you, what would you tell us to do? What? Goodness. Um, what a question. Uh, it's a big question. <laughs> research on that or making more, um, uh, give, giving more place to, for music like others? And what, what would you suggest to do? I think, I think it's really, uh, I suppose I would look at a campaign on all fronts. I think recordings are a great way of, of making music available, particularly now you know, when you have downloadable recordings as well as the tr traditional CD recordings because really w with recordings you have such a wide distribution they go all over the world and whoever is interested doesn't matter where, where they are um, they have access I think performing the music live is essential I think um, it, it, because in the recording industry there's 
there's sort of the area of recording things that haven't been done before, which, of course, everyone wants to do because it gives you a chance to do projects that might, you know, you're not recording the 120th Schoener Müller in or the 200th, you know, cycle of Beethoven sonatas. But I think it's, so I think it is important that it also gets performed live. I think a lot of uh, rarer music does get recorded nowadays, which is fantastic. But it's not always taken up by concert promoters because it, you know it's difficult to sell and there are other pressures. But I think I think it's good to get it out there whenever, wherever possible to include even in a relatively mainstream program something that you know opens a window onto the existence of you know many many composers and many many works that we just don't get to hear very often because commercially or for other reasons they're not not so easily programmable and uh, you know and I understand that takes brave. Promoters, it's a financial risk. There, there are all sorts of um, uh, problems interwoven with that. But I think I think live performance is important. I think um, talking about the music is important. Uh, you know, symposia. I think uh, you know, interviews. I think um, articles, media articles, anything that um, sort of raises the awareness and encourages people to be curious. Because ultimately, um, you know, the audience needs to be the one sort of looking for these things. You, know, you can't sort of force this music on people. Somehow, to help cultivate their interest and, and whatever means... I don't really know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge job. And I'm very, I, I admire what you're doing very much. But uh, I would like, uh, like to know, are there any composers you would like to play in the next years or mm. uh, with, uh, who you are interested in? Well, it's interesting because this some, uh, next week I'm flying to New York to play in uh, the uh, Bard Music Festival in New York, which this year is, is a focus on Alban Berg. Mm -hmm. And so as part of that festival, I'm playing some piano music by Egon Veles and some uh, piano music by Victor Ullmann, the Varitonen und Doppelfüge, on Schoenberg's uh, theme. Um, and so I, yes, the, 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 there are lots of, um, and I'm sure I will hear a lot of music there as well that, that um, will, you know, I've heard, I heard a couple of years ago some uh, Owen Schulhoff, which was fascinating, of course, you've mentioned Korngold, but there are so many composers who wrote such, such wonderful music. Um, and uh, yes, I, I try and be as open-minded as possible, so it's, it's really a question of, just something grabbing me. It doesn't matter really from necessarily from what period it is. I mean, as a pianist, you have to be so versatile these days, particularly. But um, the variation of the double figure by Ullmann yeah. is on uh, Schoenberg's Opus 19, number four. That's exactly right. Um, yes, and uh, it's a terrible, complex work. Uh, was indeed difficult to to to. to Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah. Yes, the fugue is is is, is, is unbelievable. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it, it's almost <laughs> yes. Well, I hope it's not unplayable. So I'll be in trouble. <laughs> But um, yes, it's 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 monumental, and he must have been quite a pianist because, of course, he performed it himself, and uh, it was a big success for him when he. I think it was in Geneva that he played it, and and uh, it sort of really it helped to launch him as a as a major musical figure. Um, so. Uh, yes, but they're, they're exquisitely crafted. And what's very interesting is that although the, the theme is not, is not serial, mm -hmm. he applies serial technique to the theme. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he puts the retrogades against the inversions and, and uses all these devices, as well as, you know, more conventional variation devices. So, um, yeah, but I, I'm very interested sort of in that now. And so, you know, I, I definitely will be seeking out more Victor Ullmann. And sort mm -hmm. of, I know there are several piano sonatas, which I, I don't know, and, you know, I, I will have Was a look. Is I think it has been. Um, I don't know. I'm, I, again, I'm a sort of bad person to ask about recordings because I, I often like to just study things from the score until I really, you know, until I really have my own sort of way of doing it before I allow myself to be influenced. I think you need to sort of have your own strong opinion first. Um, so I don't know, but I think it has been. I think it has been recorded. Um, But yeah, again, this is all research. This is all, you know, this is all to be done. <laughs> It's been such a hectic few weeks that, you know, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, a bit of holiday and being able to, to read up about all this and, uh, and find out. Thank you very much. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. <laughs>